stand and join as we sing today? Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Morning. Well, uh, if you guys are like me, last Sunday uh, we came to church, we had a great time, and then I think a lot of us were a little disappointed in the evening. <laughs> um, and so, uh, in uh, kind of in that vein, uh, Joe Burrow. I don't know if you guys saw this and read this about what he said afterwards. He said, "Yeah, that stung, but there's a lot to celebrate because they did have a great season." And so this morning, we come here today, uh, those of you, a lot of us here in person, those of us online, we're here to celebrate God and, uh, you know, sing and worship to him, have a message that leads us to him, but really, ultimately, to celebrate God. And there's so many things in our lives that sting, but we come here, there's so many things to celebrate too, okay? And so, uh, like I said, those you know, welcoming everybody here in person, those of you online watching, we're very happy that you're here with us today to celebrate. And so uh, I'd like to welcome you, and let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a, a beautiful morning and a beautiful day. Uh, and it's a day to celebrate you. Uh, no matter what else is going on in our lives, you know, we, we carve out times of our day and our week to celebrate your love and the things that you do in our lives. And so today, you know, may your wisdom and your love be shown here today in our worship service and with uh, Nick's word, and that you be with everybody throughout the rest of the week and show them your love and give them those things to celebrate. 
We love you, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Sing with us the solid rock. Fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All out with us when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand oh is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Uh, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that we, he loved us and sent his Son as an a, atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, um, dear friends, since God, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another.
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb. Seated on the
I would like to read a couple verses from a song that is played a lot on Caleb called Come What May. Lucky for you, I'm not confident enough, enough in my a cappella singing skills to just jump up here and start singing like Nathaniel Price did a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> the verses of the song and the chorus go like this. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. You're faithful, faithful in all things. There is deep joy that you give to me. Where hurt meets the healing is a holy thing. I see goodness, your goodness in all things. In every high, in every low, on mountaintops, down broken roads, you're still my rock, my hope remains. I'll rust in the arms of Jesus, come what may. Darren Mulligan from the band We Are Messengers shares the following about this song. In the past year, we've all collectively been forced to concede that, despite our illusions and devices, we do not get, the, get to control the world around us. Come What May is a song that not only acknowledges this reality, but revels in the fact that we have a God that loves us and is worthy of our faith, hope, and trust, no matter what circumstances we are facing. I think we can say something similar about communion. During communion, we must concede that we cannot completely control the sin in our lives. We can never be perfect enough to make it to heaven on our own. That is why we needed the perfect sacrifice. That is why we needed Jesus Christ. We should revel in the fact that we have a Savior that loves us, was willing to die on a cross for us, and is worthy of our faith, hope, and trust, no matter what circumstances we are facing. John 16.33 states, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. If you are experiencing sorrow or heartache and need to find the deep joy that comes from healing, put your hope in him during this time of communion and rest in the arms of Jesus, come what may. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for the arms of your son that, that in which we may find rest. We, we thank you for that joy that comes from your healing. And most of all, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. For it is only through that sacrifice that we have the opportunity to spend eternal life with you. It's in your son's precious name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. 
Good to see everybody today. I want to welcome those of you who are here in person and those of you who are here are online with us today. We're so glad that you are with us. And I just want to thank Patrick this morning for helping us revisit the sadness of land. <laughs> I kid you not, like yesterday, we were like on the same wavelength a week ago. We were, woke up on Sunday morning and I said, you know what? I mean, you guys know I'm a Colts fan, but I said, you know, I tell you, I got to wear Bengals colors. And so I woke up and I said, I got to find something orange and something black. And literally Patrick and I showed up in the exact, the exact same shirt <laughs> last week, thinking the exact same thing. And so I appreciate his introduction and also their family sharing that scripture with us today. Really appreciate that. This week... I read about a man who responded to a sermon. He was having, there was a sermon preached on Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. And Matthew 12, 50 is the passage of scripture where Jesus says, whoever does the will of my father is my brother and sister and mother. Essentially, Jesus says, you know, whoever does the will of my father, you know, they're my people, right? And so that's the passage. And he hears this passage, this man does. And apparently the Holy Spirit had been working on his heart and been working in him. Uh, perhaps trying to prompt him to make some core decisions in his life. And so he hears this message, and he's inspired. He's been convicted. He says, you know what? If my, any home that I have here on earth is not going to be anything compared to the home I ultimately have in heaven. And so he says, I'm going to give up my home. I'm going to give my home over to the church, and I'm going to move in with my parents. And I thought about that. And I said, I'm not really sure who's sacrificing more in this story. <laughs> The man or his parents? Let me ask this. I don't know how many of you have been following. How many of you here have been following the Olympics the past couple of weeks? Anybody been following the Olympics? We've been following the Olympics, some of us a little bit. Some of us, yeah, in and out, maybe a little bit. Let me ask this question. If you were to qualify for an Olympic, Olympic event, <laughs> Janet, <laughs> I got a little chuckle. For those of you online that couldn't hear the chuckles, that got a little bit of a chuckle here. But yeah, if you qualified for an Olympic event, it's an opportunity that comes around only every four years, right? I mean, and it's, for a lot of these athletes, it's a, def a legacy-defining moment because, let's be honest, when these, sports, these sports that we watch at the Olympics, we usually, a lot of us, only watch them every four years at the Olympics. And so we don't follow a lot of these sports very religiously, so to speak. And so for a lot of these athletes, this is the defining moment. This is the moment when they get the, the attention, the limelight, people get to know their names and stuff. And so winning at the Olympics is, is everything. It's, it's a big, big deal. So imagine you qualify for an Olympic event. Would you voluntarily give that spot up to one of your competitors? That actually happened. This Olympics. This Olympics, Erin Jackson became the first American woman to win the women's 500-meter speed skating event since 1994. And she became the first African-American woman to win a speed skating event or have a, a medal in a speed skating event, period. I mean, that alone is enough history. I mean, there's a legacy-building kind of resume. But there's even more to the story, and some of you may know this story already, but Jackson wasn't even supposed to be at the 2022 Winter Olympics. She technically didn't qualify. When it came to the U.S. trials, speed skating trials, that were the a qualifying event for the Olympics, she actually fell during the race. She finished third, and only the top two spots get to advance. And so she technically wasn't even supposed to be at the Olympics. But according to Eric Hay of NBC Sports, Brittany Bowe, who came in first at those trials in that race, decided to give up her spot out of what she called the spirit of the Olympics. She gave that spot to Jackson in order to allow her to compete at the Olympics. And this was her, her thinking, okay? Her thinking in this, for one, she looked at herself and she said, really, my best chances to medal are in the 1,000 meter and the 1,500 meters. That was really, those were her bread and butter events. And she knew that Aaron Jackson was the top rated speed skater at the 500 meters. When she came into those trials, she knew that she was the world number one. And she looked at her and said, you know what? She still is the best chance. She still is the most qualified. She still needs this spot. And so she gave up her spot to allow Aaron Jackson to be in the race in the 500 meter event. Jackson was grateful for the gesture, but of course, as any speed skater would, I mean, there's a lot of dedication that goes into that. There's a lot of effort that goes into that. And, and she knew, looking at what she did, she knew that, that Brittany Bowe was giving up a lot. She said, sure, I had a really great season, but when it came to crunch time, I made a mistake. 
I'm very fortunate that Brittany Bow is a very selfless person and that she would do something like this for me. There's certainly an amazing level of sacrifice in what Brittany Bow did. You know, even if she didn't see herself as the best 500 meter skater, you know, if it were me in that situation, I, I'd be really, really tempted to just hang on to that spot just to see if I could compete, just to see if I could be up among that group of, of elite athletes in that race. Part of me also would have been fearful over the regret that I might feel in giving that spot to somebody else only to see them falter in the event in the end. There were no guarantees Jackson was going to medal. It was an act truly of sacrifice by Brittany Bow that was made in faith. Let me ask this question. What are you doing right now in your life that requires faith? What are you doing in our lives right now that requires faith? Author Francis Chan recalls being in a class at Bible college when a professor asked him that very question, asked the students, all of the class, and he says this, he says, that question affected me deeply because at the time I could think of nothing in my life that required faith. He said, I probably wouldn't be living very differently if I didn't believe in God. My life was neither ordered nor affected by my faith like I had assumed it was. And furthermore, when I looked around, I realized I was surrounded by people who lived the same way I did. Life is comfortable when you separate yourself from people who are different from you. And he says, that's what epitomized what my life was like, characterized by comfort. So what are we doing right now that requires faith? What are we doing right now that intentionally sacrifices our comforts for the purposes of God? And what's holding us back? What keeps us from acting sacrificially in faith? In a time that we're more entrenched than ever in our, the comfort of our own corners, surrounded by the continually affirming voices of those who talk like us and look like us and think like us, in a time when we face greater temptations to consume rather than to contribute, to be the ones served rather than also the ones serving, we have to ask ourselves this question, am I doing anything right now that requires faith? Some of you remember, if you've you know, been a part of Northside for a while, you remember that before we made plans to build this structure, we actually had an alternative plan. A plan where we were simply going to build something scaled down. It was going to be something that was simply a multi-ministry kind of purpose room. And we weren't going to relocate. We were going to stay downtown. And we were going to try to operate two different facilities and things. And looking back, as I look back on probably my own mentality going into that, that, was, that first plan was really our safe choice. It was my safe choice for, no, for me personally. Shortly after our leaders announced that plan, a member of our church showed up in my office with a question I needed to hear, but a question I hated to hear at the same time. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? He correctly called attention to the reality that I was letting my fear of failure, and likely unbeknownst to him, but very well known to me, I don't think known is a word, but I just made it a word, very well known to me, I was letting also my, ultimate, my fear of ultimate rejection guide my decision making. It was something I think deep down my spirit knew was kind of milling around under the surface and I knew it was a correct observation, but man, sometimes when someone hits the nail on the head, you really just don't want to hear it, right? You're like, you're just, Ugh. but I needed to. It wasn't easy because it required me to let go of control over a ton of things. I was trying to manage to protect my own heart for more reasons than we have time to get into today. Our church had been through some difficult times, and frankly, I just didn't want to be the one to make it worse. I didn't want to make a wrong step. I didn't want to make anything worse. Frankly, I didn't want to be known forever as the guy who did make it worse. So I held back. I held on to protect what I could and make things safe for myself. And ironically, I would have done more harm to this church doing that than simply acting in faith as we have, thankfully, here today. And this is what we do. This is what we do. It's, we're, we're all the same. So often there are some really understandable reasons why we're reluctant to step out in faith. You know, we all have a story with us. We all have a story we bring into today, a story that usually includes failure or hurt or rejection. And that history can create mountains inside of us, within us, and in our spirit that make us, what's a simple choice for somebody else, like a huge mountain to overcome in our own life. 
And so there has to be understanding and grace and patience in these things. But it doesn't remove that even though those things are present and even though those things are true, it doesn't remove the challenge that we are to live and love by faith. A faith that asks us to put our lives and the things that we care most about in the hands of God. And and maybe that could be, could that be, let me just ask this question. Could it be the hands of God that where we have a little bit of an uncertainty today? Do we trust those hands? Do we trust those hands? I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 58. And we're going to go ahead and, and start there in verse 2. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 2. Here's what, what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah here to his people. Isaiah is prophesying, prophesying to the people of the kingdom of Judah. Okay, That's where he's at in Old Testament history here. And here's what he says in verse 2. Chapter 58, he says, God says this, he says, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. He's talking about his people, his people, uh, his followers, the people of the kingdom of Judah. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted? And you see it not. This is their refrain. This is their challenge to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day and a day acceptable to the Lord? Then he says this, God says, Is not this the fast I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What's going on here? God is speaking to his people in the kingdom of Judah, and he's making it clear. He's making it clear in the words of theologian Kelly M. Capick that he is not interested in empty rituals, but desires heartfelt humility and life-giving action. That's what he wants out of his... That is the mark of maturity in discipleship, is that we are are not just receiving, but we are living out life-giving action. And the example he uses to make his point, as so often happens in Scripture, is the Sabbath. That's where Jesus always loved to make. Some of his strongest points were about the Sabbath. He always liked to use that as the place where he would, the setting, that he would teach so many things. And what we find out in this passage here is this, that the highest expression of Sabbath rest is generously giving it to others. 
The highest expression of Sabbath rest is generously giving it to others. I want you to go back briefly with me to the Old Testament, where we find the, the Sabbath commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And we're going to look at this real quick. We're going to re-examine this scripture here today. Let's reread this part where we hear about the Sabbath day. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is where we originally find this commandment. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, this week I noticed something in this passage I'd never noticed before. I've read this passage like some of you have. And we've read this so many times. You've heard the Ten Commandments. I've read it over and over again. But Matthew Sleeth says this. He's the author of the book 24-6. And here's what he says. He says this. The longest of the Ten Commandments, which is what this is. The, the Sabbath commandment is the longest in verbiage. Okay? It's the longest of those Ten Commandments. The longest of the Ten Commandments tells us to keep the Sabbath. And notice also what he says. But the majority of the verbiage is about giving the Sabbath away. You can pick up on that. The majority of this passage we just read in Exodus chapter 20 is about giving Sabbath to other people. And though it certainly can include giving some literal time off, the greater aim of Sabbath is the personal discovery of the rest that God gives his people. When we help other people find this rest from the chaos and the tyranny of the fallen world, we're honoring the Sabbath day. And that means doing the things God mentioned here. It means loosing the bonds of wickedness, of sin. Undoing the straps of the burdensome yokes around people's necks. We think about the Pharisees, right? And all the laws, the religious laws they put on everybody as a way to make God happy. And, God, and Jesus said, that's not what I'm about. That's not what I'm about. When we are a balm to the bruised and abused, the sick and the weary, when we care for the needs of other people, that's why Jesus so scandalously often worked, scandalously, on the Sabbath day. To forgive sinners and heal the sick and enjoy the creation of God itself. When he would walk around through the fields with his disciples, he did all of that. He did all of that to help people experience really what the Sabbath rest is all about. And we are called ourselves to generously foster healing and provide rest and renewal and grace to others. But here's the struggle, right? Okay, so we're talking about faith, and we're going to get into that and how this all ties together in a minute. But here's one of the struggles we have. It's easy to make our spiritual activity and our peace the end rather than the means. It's very easy for us to make all of our spiritual activity and the feeling of peace that we get because of our relationship maybe with Jesus or the fact maybe I just think of myself as a good Christian. It's very easy to make all of that a, 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 the end rather than the means, Notice something really interesting about this passage in Isaiah. In this passage, when God zeroes in and he's trying to convict the people here, what is he doing? He's zeroing in on one particular aspect of their worship on the Sabbath day. He's zeroing in on fasting. Now, fasting is a sac by its definition, it is a sacrificial activity. If some of you, you know, maybe you come from a Catholic background or maybe another church background where you observe Lent, and, we're, and that season is coming up. If you are familiar with the, the church calendar, the, the Christian calendar, you know that you know, a lot of churches observe Lent going into Easter. Uh, that's just a couple of weeks away, and it's a time where people traditionally give something up. They fast, in a sense, from something. Uh, or food, or, or maybe uh, different things that might be kind of overwhelming their soul as a way of preparing themselves for worship. Fasting is an act of sacrifice. And what God, though, illuminates in this passage, as he talks to people who are actively fasting, it, he, what he illuminates here is something that should be convicting for all of us. And that's that it's possible to engage in spiritual activity like fasting and prayer and Bible study and worship without it making any difference in our life or in the life of anybody around us. The people that God is criticizing in Isaiah, they're fasting, but it wasn't translating into the way they lived. It wasn't translating into, they weren't heeding what the purpose was and letting God transform them. They were more eager to check the fasting box off their spiritual checklist than they were to feed the people who actually lived in boxes. 
of fessing in. They were more eager to check the fasting box off their checklist than to actually feed the people who were living in boxes with the love of God and in the love of God. They observed Sabbath without living Sabbath and giving Sabbath to other people. You see, fasting and prayer and study and worship are supposed to be transformative experiences that God uses to continually shape us and mold us to look like Jesus. So what makes the difference? What makes one person's fast or one person's prayer, one person's reading of Scripture transformative, life-giving, and, and, and an experience where they encounter God? And what makes another person's experience of the same thing ironically self-serving? What is the difference here? We find this, and where it all kind of comes, all of these things come together is in our third point. Life-giving generosity demands grateful self-sacrifice. And I would even say faithful self-sacrifice. Life-giving generosity demands grateful self-sacrifice. Here's the bottom line. The more I am moved by what God has done for me, and even more so by who God is. I mean, a lot of times we get transfixed on what we get out of the relationship with God. And sometimes that's what we're really after. We love what we get in the relationship with God, but how much of us really like God? Do we like God? Do we like Jesus? Like, if, God, if Jesus was, I mean, we imagine Jesus being a person here sitting in the pew with us. Is he the kind of personality we could trust? Is he a personality we could depend on? Do we like Jesus? Do we like God? I want to ask a question that hit me between the eyes this week. I think it's going to hit probably a lot of us between the eyes, but it's a good question. And it comes from John Piper, and here's what it says. He says this, the critical question The critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? And that question hit me right between the eyes because I have to admit to you, I believe there are some of us, and I would include myself like this on more days than I care to, to admit to, that would probably read that list and there are certain, you know, I'd say, you know what, yeah, maybe I could live with that. Now I know, like that's not the politically correct answer I'm supposed to be giving you from the pulpit today, but we know it's the honest answer. It's the honest answer. And I'll bet that the times we're most willing to give that answer would often also most likely coincide with the times in life when we feel most spiritually stuck. Because we've lost that, maybe we see what Jesus gets us, but we lose so much sight of who Jesus is. And, And the more I am moved by not only what God has done for me, but who he is, the more transformative all of my walk becomes. We can only extend life-giving love toward others as much as we have understood it for ourselves. And there is a lid. I mean, to the extent that we understand our relationship to God and who God is, that, 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 that sometimes puts a lid on our expression of our faith. One that God in his grace allows for us to grow with and understand him more and more by more each day. I want you to take a look at 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16, which illustrates this perfectly. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And the power, yeah, we see the example of how Jesus lived all this out, but the real power is in who Jesus is. That God is love, that Jesus is love, that he is the word. And he's trustworthy And when we see that and when these men saw the example of Jesus and how he played out and he lived out that trustworthiness, that character, the strength of character and all these things, when they saw that, they were also challenged to follow suit and we are challenged to follow suit and be following suit in faith, knowing that this is the Savior we can trust with our lives and what we have and what we have been given, that we can trust who he is, which really doesn't make our sacrifice sacrifice anymore challenge today is this give life to others by gratefully and sacrificially pouring out of your own 
And it all comes down to one word, surrender. Surrender. And you can't surrender. Again, surrender is something we do when we understand who, we, who Jesus is, that he's trustworthy, that he loves us, that he's worthy of that trust. Francis Chan invites us to imagine going for a run while eating a box of Twinkies. It's an interesting thought. Besides being self-defeating and sideache-inducing, it would also be near impossible. You'd have to stop running in order to eat the Twinkies. And as believers, we often try to live out our faith in the same way. We try to run the race, but we burden ourselves with Twinkies. And these Twinkies are labeled try harder and obligation. <laughs> And there are some of us right now, let's just take this for instance, for right now, there are some of us who are being convicted by the question I just asked moments ago, right, about heaven and about Jesus. We're being convicted. And what, automatically, what did we try to do when we were con convicted by that? We sat there in our chairs and we tried to will ourselves to love God more than we do. Because we didn't want to see the honest truth about what we were, and we, it's hard to admit so we try to will ourselves to love God more. We try to muster up more love for God, and it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Stop eating the Twinkies. To find the love of God is surrender. To find the love of God means accepting that, you, that, that the fact is that you have to do none of these things to be loved by God. His love is something that we can never do anything to lose, and it's something we can never do anything to earn. That is God's love. To understand how fully loved by God we are, stand still with your hands and stand still in your head and just know that God loves you right where you are in that moment. Stop running with Twinkies. If we let go of all of that and when we do, it's, a beautiful, it's beautiful the way that second guessing ourselves melts away. That Christ becomes our refuge and not someone we're trying to please, not someone we live in constant fear of, who's, we're fearful he's going to remove his love from us if we don't measure up. Well, when we get to that point, we realize we're free in Christ. When we realize the love is unconditional, we run toward him and we're unencumbered as we run toward him. We're unhindered by questions such as, am I doing this right or did I serve enough this week? We're free to live in grace as the Spirit of God leads us. As Francis Chan states, he says, when you're running toward Christ, you are freed up to serve, love, and give thanks without guilt, worry, or fear. But a lot of this, you see how this also, a lot of this comes down to, what do we think about the character of God? What do we think about the character of Christ? When we realize what we've gained with Christ as a person, not just because he's our Savior, but what we've gained it with him as, our, as a person, as, our, as, as a friend, as a fellow co-heir, we are all too ready and eager to give of ourselves in faith. I love what David Livingston, we talk about the example of faith and what, being willing to step out in faith. And what is, you know, how do we make that, faith, that step of self-sacrifice? I love what David Livingston says as we close. He's a missionary to Africa during the 1800s. And he once said this during a speech to students at Cambridge University. He said this, people talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. I never made a sacrifice. We ought not to talk of sacrifice when we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. When we realize who Christ is, and then we then look again to that sacrifice. There is nothing that is sacrificed then truly in our life. All is gift. All is given back to our Savior and our God in whose worthy hands it should be held. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today thankful for the challenge of faith. Lord, thankful, Lord, that it's not just what we get out of this relationship with you. But Father, you're worthy. You're worthy of our trust. You're worthy of our love, and you love us. Father, if you were in this room today, you were not the person that we would keep at arm's length, hopefully. We were the person that, you were the person that we would want to have close to us. You were the person we feel like we could take with us anywhere. You're the person who would be constantly at our side. You're the person who constantly wants to be with us and engaged with us, and, and, and not in, a, in, in, in really an obtrusive way, but as a friend and as a person who cares and as a person who is always ready to be there with us. Father, you are worthy of our trust. You are worthy of our love. You are worthy of the relationship that we have 
And Father, it is a great treasure, as it says in the, in, and Jesus said in the, in the New Testament, Lord, it's, it's a treasure that when we, want, when we find it, when we find this relationship, it's worth going and selling all that we have so that we might enjoy the treasure of what we have, Lord, in, in you. Father, everything pales in comparison. There is no greater friend that we have in our lives than you. And so, Father, as we look toward the steps of faith, whatever step we might be being challenged to walk forward in in our life right now, Lord, you're going to be there. You're going to be there with us. You're always there with us. And we thank you, Father, so much for your presence, which presence which frees us then to be generous, which frees us to live, which frees us then to express the gospel, to live out the gospel, and, and, and to be able to proclaim freedom from the captives, to be able to go and give grace abundantly, to share the message of the gospel with others who need hope in this life. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for that gift, and it's in your name we pray today. Amen. Today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we encourage you to come forward during our time of decision today. And if you're online today and you want to make the same decision, reach out to us, office at nschristianchurch.org, and we want to follow up with you as well uh, to come alongside you as you make that decision. Let's stand together and give worship to our God today as we conclude our service. Chosen.
so much for leading us today. We really appreciate that. Just want to share with you some announcements before we close today. First of all, as, as always, uh, as we, uh, we leave today, we're reminded that we have the great opportunity to participate in the grace of giving. And God is so gracious toward us, and he encourages us to give as we have put it, and he has put it in our heart to give. So we encourage you to give in the ways that you can. There are offering boxes at the rear of the room. Of course, the other methods online and P.O. box as well. Also want to remind everybody today, if you haven't seen it in Nick's Notes already, by the way, you can sign up for Nick's Notes by using that Connect card that you see in the pew. You put that in the offering box at the way out. You can sign up for Nick's Notes, and you can get all the news and updates and things that are going on week to week here. But coming up here in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be hosting the annual fundraiser banquet for the Not Alone Pregnancy Center, which is one of the most you know, precious ministries we get to support and have gotten to support for many, many years. And uh, we're excited to be able to host the center here and, the, and that event. That is March the 4th. And uh, there are a couple things we need to ask of you to consider. Uh, we'd like, first of all, if you'd just like to go to the banquet, first of all, let me just say the tickets are $30. I think uh, Rita's got a booth out there where you can kind of sign up and get those. But because we're hosting, and uh, by the way, somebody is going to be catering the event. Uh, if, who here, let me just ask this, who here misses Wayne's mashed potatoes? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, if you would like to come and eat some of Wayne's mashed potatoes, you can do that, first of all, just by being part of the banquet, but at the same time, we need servers. We're going to be serving the meal to people. We need about 30 to 40 servers. We only have about 10 signed up right now. I'm one of them. I'm already signed up, and I know some others are, but we encourage you to sign up for that, uh, if you would, and, and uh, let us know about that. I believe you can actually let Erin know about that. Just send Erin a note or talk to her afterward, and she'd love to get you signed up for that. I think the time period is about, what, 5.30 to 8, something like that, that's required for all those servers that night. So You get to eat. You get to have the meal as well. <laughs> so you get to have some of those mashed potatoes. But it's a great way to give back to our community and give back to an organization that we really love and we really support. Uh, and so we really want to encourage you to do that. And for any of you, say you're, you're, if you're one of the persons who wants to volunteer or you want to, give a, a, you want to buy a ticket, either one, we encourage you, we really need you to sign up at the booth uh, also out there because they need to have a count of who's going to be here for the food. So if you would go out there, talk to Aaron, but also go out there, put your name down so that uh, they can know, the center can know what food to prepare for. Uh, and if any of that needs clarification, uh, just see one of us afterward. We'd be glad to clarify that for you all. So this is adults, teens, whoever wants to serve their, uh, the teens or adults, we'd love to have you do that. All right. The third, the third thing I want to mention here before we close uh, just regarding groups, we've got some groups going on right now. Of course, we've got a few Bible studies going on, men's study, women's study. The women's study is Thursday night, men's study Saturday morning. Wayne's doing his study on Sundays, uh, which is going on again here uh, later on today uh, at, uh, at uh, 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, yes. Had to get it out of my head there. Uh, but we also have Celebrate Recovery. It's one of those really deep level groups that we want to get going here. We realize, hey, some of you might want to know more about that. We're going to be talking a little bit more about that as the weeks go on, but there's an informational meeting that's going to be coming up on uh, the 2nd of March that we'll meet in room 103. It's going to be a very confidential, safe environment. People that are going to lead that are going to be people who are in Celebrate Recovery, okay? So if you're sitting there like, I don't know if this is a safe place for me. It's a safe place where you can come just to explore and to hear about how this is going to unfold here uh, at uh, Northside. Like I said, we're going to talk more about that in, uh, next week as well, but we want to encourage you to have just a, on your calendar, if you're curious about that, that's Wednesday, March 2nd at, in room 103 at 6.30 p.m., right alongside the youth group. So the 103 is that classroom that's right off the foyer out there. So if you would be interested in that, uh, we really want you to, to make that a, a thing you want to be a part of and, and come to find out more about what's going on and how that will unfold. Uh, with that, I think that's all other than if you're physically able. <laughs> help us pick up these chairs, and if you would, just help us stack them uh, seven to eight high, and then we'll get them over to the side of the room. We'd appreciate that for the activities later today. With that, Wayne, would you close us with a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Thanks. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are alive in Christ Jesus, and we thank you that we can spread his love by doing the things that we read today in your scripture in Isaiah. But Father, we pray that we constantly and always look toward Jesus because he is the author and perfecter of our faith. 
So, Father, just be with us this week. Help us to love those who are probably less fortunate than us and reach out in love to those that we meet. We love you, Father, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.